Right. Okay. Thank you all for coming. Um, just a few things before we get into things. I suppose I'd like to just know a bit about um, anyone's particular background. Who amongst any of you are professional or pro am writers or illustrators? Any of you at all? Oh, that's good. Um, <laughs> uh, who out of any of you are actually role players of any description? Okay, a few, that's good. It just helps me to know what my audience is so that we can try and tailor it um, as best as we can. Okay. I've got a Okay, we've decided to call this uh, uh, presentation that we're talking today uh, is the fight for the future, which is actually a bit of a slogan that we actually use in part of our marketing for our own game, but has a double meaning in that, uh, like many people in New Zealand, we are actually fighting for the future of our own project, and many people in New Zealand will actually find it quite difficult to um, undertake a sort of a niche publishing project out of New Zealand and try and do it themselves. So we just thought about my pretty slogan would be a uh, good way to start it off. Um, so anyway, what we're basically going to do today is share our experiences um, of independent role-playing game publishing. Um, share it to the pro <laughs> 43 slides. Um, so we're going to go through this pretty uh, at a fast pace and then let you have a Q&A later. Um, but the idea is that we are hoping to follow this kind of structure today which is obviously introducing who we are and various parts of the team that are here today. An overview of what we've actually done, uh, what our results were, um, which I think you'll find rather interesting. What the sort of market conditions are, many of you as gamers will probably have some understanding as far as um, that market for being a consumer in the first place in games, but there's some other factors that if you want to publish your own game, you need to be aware of some other things. Um, what we'll discuss is also what you need to do, uh, what you need to undertake publishing for yourself, um, how you can go about doing it, um, and then we'll go to some questions and answers if you have any at the end, and then we'll obviously wrap it up. So, to start with, um, basically, the F Space RPG Development Group is really just the name that we use for the people who have worked on the project. Uh, a number of us have uh, been together for about 16 years, um, it's been going quite a long time. Um, others uh, have joined us a little bit later. F Space Publications is just a trade name that we operate for as a business, and obviously it's all part of brand building. We obviously need a company name, so that's us. Uh, I'd like to introduce Stephen. Uh, Stephen is usually a Hey Jess, do you want something? Okay, so we'll keep that brief. Uh, there's Gary behind the camera, and um, Philip Warms is another one of our team. Um, these are all that we could actually manage to put in one room at one time at the moment. Our team is uh, spread all around the world now. Um, our primary uh, illustrator actually uh, works as a uh, animator in Brisbane now, and um, one of our editors is in London and we've got a few other people scattered around, so it's actually a rare event for four of us to be in the same room together. Um, and there's obviously myself, Martin Wright. I'm actually the creator of this game uh, in the first place. Principal writer, web designer, uh, graphic designer for it, secondary illustrator, the accountant. The around, yeah, yeah um, basically a jack of all trades, um, and you'll soon learn that you'll probably need all these types of skills to do it. Um, I suppose the major thing uh, for you as well is you're sort of wondering who we are professionally. We don't do this game full time, but our backgrounds are all quite diverse. I myself at the moment work for IPC Council doing both project management and graphic design, and um, I've had a career doing graphic design, web design, print management, um, as well as web design, development, that type of stuff. And, uh, uh, I work for Hewlett Packard, 
uh, doing support on Unix and Linux systems. Um, and I also spend a bit of time doing web design, PHP development, um, that sort of thing. Well, I'm a uh, geologist. I work for GNX Science. Well, we'll be up till uh, the middle of next week when I'm off to Australia. Um, so, yeah. And Um, I'm also a geologist. I currently work on the oil rigs um, in the exploration side. Uh, currently working off Taranaki for AWE. Okay. Um, so that sort of gives you who we are. Anyway, the game began basically um, in a number of ways, but um, one of the key things that we learned is the origins of anything that you work on is quite important in a project. and. Um, you're influenced obviously by everything that you come in contact, prior games, uh, your own hobbies and interests, and various things like that. So we basically um, just going to go through discussing what it is, how we made our start, and um, what we did. And then obviously talking about how we put this together. We've launched a market trial of product, uh, a number of you probably are familiar with our attempt at doing that. And what we've been uh, exploring in the way of taking it further. So for the origins, basically, like everyone, starts at childhood. Uh, for me, one thing is that you'll notice that with F-Space, it's a sort of a hardcore mainstream science fiction game. And for me, sci-fi was one of the first memories I actually have as a child. Some black and white, I think. Uh, I don't know what it was, probably um, Flash Gordon's on TV. So, um, But the type of television that I watched and things as a kid probably influenced a lot of what this game has turned out like. And I will admit, when Star Wars came out, that was you know, one of those big influencing things. Um, college is really where things in a gaming sense began. Obviously, that's where I started to get introduced to role playing games. My origins with that are mainly within Traveller. And you'll probably see a parallel in the fact that I've worked on this game and the fact that it um, has some striking similarities to travel, but I also did Star Frontiers and things like that, even ADD and things like that. But uh, nothing really serious. It wasn't until Varsity, when you sort of have that bit more freedom and time, creative expression, that began to explore things and get a bit frustrated with the role playing games that you're dealing with. And like everyone, you come up with your own variants and even attempted to write a game in the late 1980s and actually failed. Um, it wasn't Place. So we move on to me actually making the start. What it was was I had this great idea and it came about because I'd thrown away every commercial role playing game I had, um, sold them all, and just sat there in a vacuum writing a couple of stories. I had characters and ideas and concepts in my head and um, needed a way to express them and current role playing structures didn't let me do that. So I just sat there and wrote. Had a really great idea and uh, wrote a bunch of rules that I sort of were quite happy with doing. And then demoed over the game. Uh, three groups. Gary was, in fact, one of the first ones. So it was back in 1991. Um, they liked it enough that they kept playing. We merged the group together and kept going. And during the course of this, I decided why not put my rules together into a little booklet. And, um, like most people, we still do it, and in fact, one of the originals still survives. Very terrible little thing. Um, and like, this was actually laid up in the desktop publishing package of its day. It was nothing fantastic. Um, but at that stage, it was still quite an achievement to actually sit there and put together a book and go and get it photocopied and hand it all out. At this stage, we had no real concept that it could be a commercial possibility. At this stage, we just had people involved and people who scribble on backs of character sheets or backs of rule books. There's another one that has a cartoon with Mr. Egg on it. Um, but we had a lot of people that, like most people, were just hobby gamers. But we made a start and um, we decided to take it a little bit further than that because we thought we probably had the right skills to go and take this and do a bit of job with more art and uh, something a bit more substantial, because this is a rule book which virtually tells you nothing about the universe itself. Uh, and as you can see, we, I called it actually something completely different, under a completely different brand name than the first time. 
Um, and in fact, we didn't actually rebrand the company until 1993. Um, so we started with setting a benchmark. What did we want to achieve? And that's always important when you embark on a project, not just some nebulous idea, but look at the market and say, I want to meet that. And at that stage, I said, I like Palladium Games books at that stage. They had a really nice art style, simplistic layout, but it was effective, and they produced relatively good quality products at the time. Not the top end of the market. Um, obviously, at that stage, TSR was still uh, putting together some pretty good, uh, higher quality books in Palladium at that stage, as far as their um, production quality. So what we used to put it all together, um, I originally started this project on some Atari ST computers using a piece of software called PageStream and actually found that we couldn't do it uh, the way we wanted to. Back in those days, the old computers um, had to load the entire document into memory to manage them, unlike modern computers uh, software, which you basically can manage multi-thousands of pages depending on what application you're using and it doesn't have to load it all into memory um, because they use virtual memory. So we struggled a bit with these tools, trying to do things. We could only put about four or five images um, on one page together before I ran out of RAM. So I kept having to buy a new computer to get on with the next part of the thing. So that was quite useful. The art we did at that stage um, was all quite hand done, so pretty much standard painting and drawing materials, so nothing fantastic. But at this initial stage, I went through three computer systems. Um, to get to the level to uh, begin putting the, uh, the next book together. And um, we obviously spent a lot of time trying to formalise a way of doing development as opposed to just, hey, this was something originating out of our gaming sessions at the time. So a bit of structure to it and organising, trying to figure out who did what and how we're going to edit this thing in the end. And, who was going to scan in artwork so we could actually put it on. So there was a lot of things we had to uh, deal with. But we finally achieved a rule book. Looks like that. I don't actually have a sample of this thing. It's about 130 pages. Um, very simple style. Um, the masters we actually uh, originally printed and made books from are actually sitting at home. But I've sold all the copies. We just initially ring bound it. It was cheap and easy. At this stage, we hadn't looked at production. This was kind of our tenth copy of the that one. Yeah. Um, the PDF of this one does actually exist on a CD ROM, so if anyone actually wants to see what it looked like. Still fairly basic, um, but it was an achievement getting there and you know getting this far as some cover art and things like that, which these days there's a lot more people around doing this kind of thing at um, affordable rates these days. This gave us a benchmark which we thought, hey. We've actually done not so bad, but it needs to move on a little bit before we can publish it. This book was ready in 1995, um, at the time for the CampCon convention of that year. Well, we tried to have it ready. Um, I had a computer crash um, just while we were in the middle of printing it for it, so I only turned up with about half the book, mm -hmm. um, which was a bit of a shame. And one of our artists, Aaron, was actually at the convention sitting at the bar drawing art for um, the next iteration of the World Cup, which we were already planning. So, um, and this is in fact uh, the convention where Stephen actually first encountered the game um, and came on board as a developer shortly afterwards. So it was one of those times of going out, taking our thing out to the market, testing it again, seeing what people think of the game and you know, you get people who want to participate and who like Stephen to stay with us for quite some time. Okay, we obviously decided to go further, which was evaluating the tenth of what we've done, um, which is testing. And I must admit that I had a lot of critics. Um, there's always people that have their own opinion. Um, in fact, before we put this rule book, when I put the first one together, I sort of um, sounded like one of those really eager one people when I did this. I had a couple of articles in the old Generals of Dragons and Dice magazine about it. And uh, someone wrote an article about home-baked game systems, um, which I was told by uh, Steve Martin at the time it was a direct article directed at me, <laughs> um, basically. So we took it further. So we just didn't treat it as a dream, but actually got out there and tried to do something about it. And Steve Martin um, reviewed this other uh, version of the rule book, gave us a lot of insight, which is quite good, because at that time, it was obviously running the 
mining game is stored. So to have the feedback of an active gamer is also a retailer is actually a really, really good thing. A number of other people sort of criticised the balance of the game or the rules or what we should focus on. And in the end, that caused a delay for me actually. Uh, it was how do I deal with this? And it was kind of trying to meet all these demands. In the end, I have sort of covered over a few basics for a few people, but in the end, I decided to stick with my vision and go with it because that's what I wanted to do. And um, if people didn't like it, well, they didn't like it. So, unfortunately, that caused a delay. We were originally going to launch um, the book in 1997. It wasn't until 1999 that we finally got around to doing something. So, as you can tell, a big chunk of time has gone by since we first developed the game and put that together. So, it does take quite a bit. And at the beginning, we really didn't have any skills for doing this. So, during this process, we're obviously learning what we need to do to put it together. So, we started working towards an even better product with the idea of going to a market trial. And in fact, in 1999, we had some books to, uh, together at that point, but we launched them on CD-ROM for a limited distribution uh, to get sort of circulated around a bit more to a few more. So we probably sold about 35 or 40 at that stage. Um, not a huge thing, but we had an intention to go for a good quality product with some intentions to going out there and marketing it. So we revised our rule books again. We actually came up with two. Um, the smaller one, which most people have probably seen this one at various stages. Oh, yes. Yes, I can bring the other one. But we produced this book, and most people have probably seen this at one point or another. It's about the same size as the other rule book we did, but this is actually the condensed form of the rule book. We actually have a full size one that's. Um, about two, just over 230 pages. So this was a cut down one, which was cheaper. We cut it down for purposes of um, production cost. And um, yeah, binding was another problem. Um, wire binding was fine, but at that stage, um, I had access to spiral binding. Um, and, uh, but it was really the costs, being digitally printed at the time, the cost was quite prohibitive. But at the same time, we launched these together, which were these uh, CD ROM as well. Um, and the main thing we wanted with this was something that we could probably push into a retail space. And um, this CD-ROM, we've actually got manufactured, so it's not just a CDR burnt. We discovered in our earlier attempt in 1999 that at that stage CD media and the writers were quite unstable at that time, and we had a lot of people who couldn't read them, and cross-platform standards probably were common. A lot of incompatibility. Yeah. So it's actually a proper glass mastered CD, screen printed, and to get this to an affordable rate, we had to produce a thousand of them to get the price down. And the inserts here are actually offset printed. Digital print at that stage was very expensive for colour. So we basically had to go to full bulk to get this done. And for the books, we initially ran about 110 of these um, to go with that. And, um, We've since produced further, further um, copies as and where people want to buy them. But um, in all, that cost us quite a, uh, a lot of money. Um, I think that plus some of the things that we would have done cost me well over ten thousand um, dollars at that stage. Um, and the major thing with the launch is that we went out to attend conventions. We attended one Armageddon Pulp Expo in Auckland in two thousand one. We attended the Wellington one in 2001, um, and then Wellington, uh, Auckland again in 2002, as well as we went to Capcom of one of those years as well. So the main thing was to get in front of people, get the product in front, sell it. And um, it's a very uh, interesting thing because you actually have to sell the product direct to your customer. Um, and that helps you get that interaction and feedback. I had people at Auckland come up to me and say, I've come to buy a thing, I've heard about it. So that's quite interesting um, to find that someone in Auckland heard about it before we've ever done anything particularly major. So here's some really bad photos, I must apologise. Digital cameras back in those days were not particularly fascinating, but 
Stephen's up there. <laughs> um, and so these are the kind of things yeah. that we did. Obviously, at the thing, uh, the back shop is actually one of um, Capcom. Capcom. Yeah. Um, the others are with the one with Stephen in is one of our stands from Wellington, and the others are I think our Auckland stand. So you can see rows and rows of CDs, and we've got posters. we have computers there with us and things like that. Oh, so role playing, old role playing games, and that sort of yeah. Thing. So we basically cover our cost and some other things, and I'll talk about how we um, dealt with our expenses later. So really from after doing all that, it's sort of evaluating what we did. One thing is that I think we anticipated that our, uh, a certain size of market uh, in New Zealand, in fact, surprisingly, based on how many we've actually shipped, we actually um, was on the market that we're looking at was quite a bit larger. And we were using black population to back, uh, try and figure out how big the US, and Australia, and Canada, England, obviously the countries, would be for market share if we could ever get them in there. So to get some figures about uh, that market size. So really, it's we've got that. We talked to some distributors and retailers. They told us, because they're quite serious, how many of uh, products they were pushing uh, at that stage for um, like 30 D and D had just come out um, roughly around then. And they were telling us that the kind of volumes they were pushing, including into New Zealand, so it was actually quite interesting. And because we finally at this stage, um, although we've done digital and offset printing, we had prices to do offset printing costs to actually get our full world work done. So we sort of had to look at costs and find out what retailers were margins on and distributors margins were like, freight costs, there's a lot of things that you've got to look at. So we analysed that information and at this stage I was actually doing, had returned to Victoria University to do a postgrad in marketing so I actually had a research project that I did um, uh, over two years at Victoria to look at uh, setting up a publishing company based out of New Zealand for electronic books largely we've already experimented in it because a lot of books were on here. Um, there's well over a thousand pages of the game on that. Um, and we'd also experimented on one of the early adopters of doing uh, online uh, ebook sales. So, and a few other vendors were out at that stage. So this is around 2001. And um, we thought it showed some promise. And um, my research generally came into the conclusion that we didn't have enough um, we gathered a lot of information about people's preferences and things, um, and it's quite uh, an in-depth uh, amount of information. I won't bother digging it out, but let's just say the research data was this thick, um, bound volumes, so it was something quite substantial. And um, the conclusion of it was it was quite helpful, um, and we reached a conclusion: a business model, a marketing plan, and said, "Let's do it." Um, unfortunately, we didn't take it any further, but as I'll talk about a bit later, the market globally has actually changed and some of what we would like to have done, other people who have had better access to the resources and sitting in bigger markets like the United States have actually been doing it now and uh, you'll find a lot of the big uh, publishing players have adopted ebooks as a legitimate sales method. Um, so we went around looking for capital to do what we needed to do. Um, and offset printing books is quite expensive. Um, for our things, to prices wise, we need to print just over 3,000 of them. Um, and we're looking in New Zealand terms of about $25,000. So it's, you can vary that price up and down depending on the quality of the book that you want to do. But that was basically just a book twice that size, black and white interior, color exterior, but a perfect bound um, book like you'd probably expect, like plating. Games. So not really the nice hardback things that you so that, that kind of thing at that stage. Um, the price tag is a lot more. So we had some issues and believe it or not we actually haven't solved the capital problem um, that we're facing and that's why we pinned our hopes on ebooks because it's a cheap medium. So we also explored production options. Um, obviously uh, a lot of people didn't like this format. Um, retailers don't like it too much and um, distributors just won't talk to you. Um, CD-ROMs, we found 
sell that independently and a lot of people don't know what they're doing with it. It's quite successful direct, but we had a lot of retailers that came back to us and said, you know, it needs a box. So we went and priced boxes. And uh, that proved to be very, very expensive. And surprisingly, no one had, no one had a template for a software box in New Zealand. They were all manufactured overseas, so we'd have to put together a die and get it. Check the prestige packaging out of all from. Yeah, the, the, a lot of things have changed now. Um, back in the older days, we had some issues. This is pre, you know, D20, any of that kind of so stuff. So you do a vast variety of boxes for all sorts of retailers. Yep. You want a box, yeah. you give them the specs of what you want, and they'll Oh, get you can get them too. made, but you have to pay for it. You have to design the die or get someone to do it. You pay the uh, uh, cost of getting that knife made, etc., and that's starting at $500 just for that alone. So, there wasn't any cheap options for us to repackage our game. That's the closest thing I could come up with. And retailers suggested this, could, and especially now, most uh, a lot of people are going to smaller and smaller packaging for software. Apple, as a prime example, Adobe have also moved to a small box that's just literally this size, almost front on, and actually contains this inside, uh, uh, one of these things inside. So the market's kind of changed in their expectations. But in the end, People were expecting a nice glossy offset print of the book, and the end most gamers want that in the end, so we obviously uh, had some issues. But we're looking at various options of binding. Could we do anything ourselves? And we've gone to everything from a nice little creative concept on cut that's actually all folded, drilled and everything, so it's actually just a reference manual we've done again, and it's done by hand exploring some other types of uh, hand binding, which opens quite flat, which actually can be quite useful for gamers, but um, that's unfortunately not a particularly good one. Or your classic perfect bound book, in this case we've gone to some extremes with cover, but we just basically experimented. And these were actually for a recent design, and they're actually done by me. Um, but we've really had some issues. But one of the some things that we have done is take our own website up to something a bit more fantastic, which you don't see there. It's actually a mess right now, I must apologize. It's a dynamically powered site. We had um, uh, an online uh, shop on it um, since about uh, 2000. Um, we expanded it to a full database driven thing, and it did have submission pages and everything on it. At the moment, for yeah. security reasons, I've um, had to um, migrating everything right now, so what's there is actually half of it functional again. So uh, that obviously has a huge impact, and um, the time it was also that you're trying to do when you're trying to maintain these things to push what should be going. Uh, focus on the administration. Anyway. How we did? One of the things is how many copies have we actually got in circulation? It's only about 1,200, but that's still pretty reasonable. Yeah, it's pretty good. Um, and uh, for, I'm not counting a double hit when we sell the book with CD. I'm not counting it as a single hit. And that's, otherwise it's a bit unbalanced. Um, where were they distributed? This is the interesting thing that you probably know. It's based on thing, uh, being in New Zealand as how well did we get overseas. And that's New Zealand. Most of them are here. Obviously, the remainder is international. So we didn't really get a high penetration on the suit. There's a number of reasons for that. Can I ask you a question? Yep. What was your percentage of marketing overseas? Um, I spent a lot of time uh, sending uh, letters uh, emails at that stage to every retailer I could find on the internet at that point uh, and distributors and things like that. So we didn't get a lot of take up at that stage. It has a lot to do with the product. Uh, we had a website that could view the product and take a look at what they, you know, they wanted to do it. So we did very badly in that regard. Our retail presence in New Zealand was only five stores. Um, not that New Zealand was terribly many, but at that stage we got the two major Wellington stores um, that were around at the time, uh, one in Palmerston North, one in Auckland, and we got one computer store here and one in Carriot. Uh, they were a national chain, um, but sort of they didn't like that, so it didn't go any further at that stage. Um, and 
dolls and prepare for new DVD cases at that stage because it's still quite expensive. Um, we've got two retailers in the United States carrying the product, one in the UK, and that was it. Not terribly many in the way of retailers. Um, I decided not to push it too much because even though it's you're not having a, distribu a distributor margin getting in the way, the problem is the freight costs. Basically, to ship one rule book set is about $10 to someone overseas, so you have to build that into your margins, and we found it quite tight. Um, the breakdown by the types of things that we've solved, how we've solved them, is probably a more interesting one. And you've seen we've solved most of them at conventions. The Armageddon pulp expires, well, probably that should have stopped um, moving them. So, plus the other ones, I don't discount the smaller game conventions, they're always quite good. And obviously, direct off a website, very low. We actually, for, this, for our game, we've actually sold a bucket load of stuff off our website in the past, but that's because we were selling other role playing games and other science fiction fantasy collectibles for a while, um, largely second hand, and we were selling them to an overseas audience. So, we even were selling them to um, US retailers that were looking for old product um, because they were in that market space. So, I you know, shipped huge boxes of stage to one. Um, trade me actually works a lot better for us than our own website. Um, and that's something we've only done the last couple of years. So that's proven to be relatively okay, but it only takes over a certain number, uh, a low level of sales, but it adds up over time and gets some exposure. Uh, New Zealand retailers obviously a very small component as well. You know, it's not that much. Neither would overseas retail. And you've got vendors at the same time. Which generally shows that conventions and direct New Zealand sales are basically hand in hand with each other. So we didn't do terribly too well in that regards. Um, breakdown of the type of product we sold is this. So basically, mainly still CD ROMs that we shot. Um, but we still did a fair proportion of these books of some description or other, whether it's that reference manual, um, the larger version of it, um, some other books, um, like uh, Stephen has written one rather large scenario, we've got about 10 or so supplementary books that we've sold, and there are people that have even bought my um, edited copies that I've scribbled all over. There's collectors who are actually going out of their way to ask me for when there's one-off unique ones around, so they buy them at ring binders, they don't care, they're quite happy with it, and sometimes we've sold them in El Chipo. It's like, okay, we're finished with it. It's perfectly good. It's only got a couple of highlights in it. You put it on a trade me for $3 and something like so. that. A lot good. of the collectors like books, you know. And, yeah. so. and some other people just want something cheap to look at. They'd, they'd rather have a folder with um, stuff in it than a CD room. So we normally package up a CD room if it's uh, priced a bit And ebooks, what I mean by this is not sold on a CD room. So these are the ebooks that we've sold through a down uh, online um, service that we trialled. Um, very small um, percentage of sales, but it's there. And um, you'll see that. You're guessing you have rounded your percentages. Is that 101 percent? Uh, it probably is doing that itself. Yeah. 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 So it's work out data. So yeah. Okay. But uh, it's all rounded. Probably reduce the book percentage down. Um, CD ROMs are definitely a major thing. You might be interested in knowing how much we spent. I'm not really going to tell you how much, um, but it's over that. But I will say it is far more than that. Um, in the course of this project, I can say that I have had to purchase 12 different computer systems throughout the entire period of it to do what I needed to do. I probably went through several versions myself yeah. just trying to get the box finished. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, won't, I can't copy for the rest of it, but the computer hardware alone is expensive. We've talked about some of the production, the cost of going to conventions, things like that. I mean, this is a very small figure. Um, it is quite hard to differentiate, and I'll explain why it's a bit hard. And you may want to know how much profit we've made. None! <laughs> How much have we lost? <laughs> a lot. <laughs> okay, so this is one of the things, if you're interested in doing it, you can learn from some of our mistakes, um, which is the, uh, one of the reasons we're here. 
and <laughs> it's not. Um, there are other ways to offset your expenses. As I explained with our website, we did sell other gaming material and Steam mm -hmm. conventions where we did. I found that was the way to approach things yeah. like farming. Um, Model crafts and hobbies, RDBs, uh, people secondhand, uh, gaming, novels, other collectibles. That all helps add uh, sort of to paying for attending those type of conventions. They get a lot of foot traffic, but you get very small sales in this type of niche. So you need a lot of different things. Either that or you need a fast moving um, consumer item that they're going to be interested in. Um, but for us, we have to do it. Other ways I've uh, covered some expenses is that I have actually worked um, for doing Game Board Maps for Jolly Roger Games in the United States and worked with Mark Miller, the creator of Traveller, on that. He was actually their marketing and uh, production consultant. Um, so they obviously got some revenue back and um, sort of put us a bit on the map of the minds of a few people over there um, that we could actually. Like as typical of New Zealanders, we could turn around doing some excellent quality work for that. But to do that work, we used computers as well as traditional art techniques to do these game board maps to high resolution standards um, for them. And it was, I must admit, a ten and a half thousand dollar computer I was using to do that work uh, for myself, and as well as uh, artists involved in doing it. So we really did try to recover a cost that way. Other things, of course, are obviously freelance doing both graphic design, web design, um, but web hosting um, off my own gear. All that tries to help to recoup your costs um, on some of this capital outlay if you go that far. So it's not so bad, as it may seem. But if you were to strip everything away and just say what I needed to do the game, I still lost money. So the market conditions, well everything's kind of changed these days. As we all know, and it has been for some time, there's declining retail outlets and a shift towards other products. Over time, those shifts have come and go on. Role playing's still around and it goes around in eddies, but retailers don't rely on it as their principal product. And as we know, traditional retailers are very much dominated by particular major brands of games, so there's not a lot of um, space for a minor player in retail presence, especially if you're trying to deal with a remote market yourself. Um, it's quite hard. But the key thing is increasing online outlets. We all know about it. We bought things from Amazon, and there are plenty of other uh, places that sell them. Most of the major publishers sell off their own sites anyway. But it's still a trend for more and more of these outlets coming on. But as I said, offset printed high quality productions are definitely still the primary standard. The key thing is freight prices are still increasing on us, um, and that really affects us operating out of New Zealand. Um, if we do anything here. Offset print prices are slowly increasing, but they're steady enough. I often will get uh, my main rule book requited every couple of years, and the pricing, though, as an average across several printers is going up, I can still tell you I can get a 240 page book, 3,000 on printed for about 25 grand, and that's a decent quality. You can push that down further if you want to. Now, the one major thing that's happening is obviously digital print prices are dropping massively. Um, Stephen knows mm. quite fully with the comic book, which um, I arranged uh, printing for him. Um, one of the city council, for instance, owns quite a lot of kit, and uh, we basically, uh, our excess capacity, we uh, use it to print work for other people. But we actually do charge uh, the going rate. But the charges from the likes of Fuji Xerox, who we get the equipment from, I'm going to tell you what they're charging us. But those prices have come down significantly. Where a one side of an A4, uh, just a couple of months ago, used to cost us a dollar plus GST, um, that's dropped. It's half. It's actually a little less than that. Um, but compare this to where you may have gone to a coffee shop when we were first starting, that's for like $5, $5 or $6 for the colour A4. So that sort of is quite good. The quality is obviously improving as well, and we'll talk a bit more about digital printing. A key thing to watch for is digital storage is increasing capacity and dropping in price. Um, obviously, CDs have all been quite cheap. DVDRs, single layers are down to the, you know dollar for a printable one. Dual layer DVDs are still quite expensive, um, but they'll come down. And things like flash drives. I've got a four gig flash pen drive that cost me under a hundred dollars. So. 
And the compatibility is a lot better now. Yeah. And this has some implications on how we're suggesting we should go forward. And obviously the electronic media distribution is increasing. We've all seen that with the likes of the iTunes movie stores, um, uh, music uh, and video. There's tons of different people buying them and paying good money for that stuff. Um, and of course, ebooks have been adopted as a legitimate media for sales by most major gaming publishers. And I will tell you a site where you can go and take a look at all this stuff. And obviously, the generation of ebooks and quality of digital media is getting better and cheaper. Um, and obviously, the proliferation of portable, powerful digital devices are more common. This thing is far more grunty than the computers we used for about half the duration of the project. So, I mean, it's crazy. Uh, and in fact, it has a screen size uh, resolution of this one, which is now slightly being dated, about the same size as the first computers I was using, <laughs> 320 So you could probably get the software for this thing, which is Windows Mobile, and you could probably publish your whole game on it. In fact, the full size rule book is actually on this device as a PDF. So, and now, when we first started, Palm Pilots and things couldn't actually render PDFs in their original form, they had to be translated and our rule book turned out really terrible, so um, we couldn't put our full rule book on it. But now most devices, uh, modern ones, can do a full PDF on them, and they're actually quite really good. Um, and of course, with high resolution screens, or pervasive devices, that as a delivery mechanism is going to be quite things. Now some other things, retailers have uh, marked up their games by about 50 to 100%. So if you sell them for 20, they sell them for 20, they'll sell it for about 40. Um, and that's an important thing to understand that when you start going through your business. Distributors, 50%. Freight is a real problem. It's either you start dealing with New Zealand Post um, or courier companies and you basically get charged a fortune and um, it really, I'd say, is $10 per book. Uh, large, thick book is a good basis for postage and packaging, some of the marketing materials you might include with it to go with where you're going to get it from. Um, but you can drive that down, but freight forwarding is really complicated to deal with, so it's a good idea to try and get in a relationship with someone, but that's for volume. That's where you really want to set a big volume to, some, to someone and go forward and distribute it. Ebooks get you a really good return. Um, they offer really good rates for you to get your money. The amount that they're giving is declining a little bit over time. It's probably just because their expenses related in some of things. Um, of course, with uh, digital rights management, a lot of people are removing them. Wizards of the Coast have uh, taken DRM off their inbox. So they'll actually reduce their own expenses, maximize their profits. But it shows a change in business model, so you shouldn't fear selling your books actually on your own site anymore. Sure, they're going to wind up on BitTorrent and all the other ones at some stage, but the idea is that you want your ebooks to help drive a physical book sale at some point. But I say get in there and um, make as much money as you can before they, uh, someone goes out there and uh, distributes it illegally. But anyway, I just want to make a comment on that. Yep. I actually saw a thing on um, the Story Games one recently about someone who was publishing ebooks and found them on one of the uh, pirate sites and actually got the people to replace it with the demo for his game, mm. which he said worked pretty well. Yeah. There's, there's <laughs> some, yeah. You can do things like that. Um, I think the industry is really feeling that um, a, lo a lot of the ones on BitTorrent and things like that are scanned ones or badly OCR and things like that, so if people want a really nice quality ebook, they'll come and get it. And they own a legitimate copy. And the good thing is a lot of the ebook vendors actually do print on demand as well. So if you want a physical, digital printed copy, they'll produce it as well, so which is quite useful. And some of them do it a business model where you get the ebook now, and you'll get the physical one later. And that's, if you can find a bit of like that's probably good. Anyway, we're now probably gonna march quickly through what you'd probably wanna do if you wanna publish yourself, and why would you do it? Obviously, you wanna be creative and expressive. Some people enjoy the challenge. <laughs> More basicists. Yeah. Um, and there's uh, some skills development and professional spin offs, and I think Stephen's one of those who's had a bit of a spin off from being involved. Oh, yeah, well, certainly a lot of, um, you get a lot of experience in dealing with things like the website and certainly publishing. 
you know, you obviously, if you, if, if you actually want to go out and you want to start publishing these books, then, you know, when you actually write them in the first place, you've got to, you've got to lay them out in a way that, that they can be published, and, you know, you've got to think about artwork, you know, what kind of artwork do I want with this kind of page, and it, 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 it's a lot bigger kind of a thing, and, and so you, you, you do learn a lot of skills around that kind of thing, and, and even just the writing, you know, being able to sit down and actually pump out <coughs> an 80-page scenario, you know, you've got to know what, get yourself in the right kind of mood to do that, you know. Yeah. But it's a good project to get involved in. Seeing those others not working for a lot of areas. Is it on or is it me? Uh, it might be me, so I apologize if I'm just can anyone hear this? It's a good project to yeah. get involved. Anyway, I apologise for the audio. But Aaron's our principal artist. Um, he just used to doodle on the back of character sheets. Always an artistic person. The bulk of his illustrated portfolio has been for us, several hundred pieces. Um, and I did the art direction of him and uh, got him to change his art style for the purposes of our game. Um, that gave him a polished portfolio. He's now an animator working in Brisbane um, for a visual effects company. So he's managed to take something out of this. And this wasn't when I met him what he was doing or planning to do professionally. Myself, the entire career that I have has come out of the skills I did develop out of this. It's not what I started. Uh, when I started this game, I was in varsity doing geology degree, much like this. Um, but my skills in graphic design, illustration, web design, uh, program management, the whole lot, pretty much have come out of this project. Um, I now have qualifications in those areas, but I didn't sit them. I got um, uh, certified by looking at the work that I've actually done um, and um, being awarded those qualifications uh, based on it. But I professionally work in that field now um, and have been for over a decade, and um, it's quite useful. So once you're into a professional mode, there's crossover in everything that you do, because you often, in your own personal project, you might be breaking your ground, that filters back into your Life. So there are other tangible benefits even if you are spending a lot of money at the time on the project you know, probably see some rewards out of it. Some core skills that you're going to probably need to do a project, obviously writing, editing, graphic design and illustration. Um, some people overlook the editing part. Um, I advise anyone, and if you can, get another editor other than yourself. I'm still picking up errors in my own books, uh, even after we've had four editors go over them. Um, so, uh, uh, is a good thing. Graphic design is important if you really want to take it to a nice professional polished product. Um, you look at ours and you probably think, well, that doesn't look like the top end of the market today. Um, and it certainly it isn't. Um, and it isn't a high design thing. But these days, a lot of uh, your market interest in that. And illustration is obviously very important for all kind of games these days, especially for myself product. People often buy them in pictures. I know there's several of our developers who. I like playing games, but they hardly read words it's the pictures. Um, you know, the type of people that read the comics and stuff like that. So that are those people that are uh, oriented towards the visual side of games. And that's quite important in establishing the brand and the style of the game. But some core cool qualities you're going to need, or whoever's going to work on this, is that you need to be disciplined. There's a lot of work involved. Depending on how far you want to take it, you need to be dedicated to it. Motivated to keep going, and you obviously have to be inspired, but most people are talking about that anyway. And obviously, when you're striking out, you're going to have to make the decision of whether to publish and support your own game system or publish for an existing system. Uh, and that depends what you want, why, you know, things like that. And then you'll have to consider whether you want to self publish or submit to a publisher. Self publishing leaves you with all the control, um, it just means you don't have the funding. But if you've got a rating success, you're the one who's going to get the financial benefit out of doing it. Most publishers, if you're publishing for, say, a game system, they have you. You do get reasonable royalties, but it's quite low. But fortunately, you won't be expected to do all the work. Um, 
there are quite a few people in New Zealand who have gone and gotten full um, books for other games actually published through publishers, and they get between about four to ten percent royalties from what you um, pull. So it all varies, um, but you'll have to make the decision for which option. You'll also have to look at whether, if you're doing it yourself, whether you're going to copyright the game or go with the open gaming license or some other method. Um, and you'll find that quite important when you, uh, especially if you're publishing it for the likes of D20 or something like that. And you're going to have to define whether it's a hobby or a business. How are we doing for time? Just a hmm? We're coming up to okay. about four minutes. Four minutes, okay, I'll rush through this. Okay. People, you're going to need resources, people with the skills required, training if you require it, obviously a computer, software, internet access and some finances. Should the computer be plural? Yeah. <laughs> I'm about to tell you that you don't need that. Um, the people you're going to need are uh, some players in your group, uh, people that you can get involved, your friends and family. Sometimes you're going to have to pay people. And hopefully volunteers, the gaming community, <coughs> and open sourcing are some other options. The open gaming license has been one way you could actually leave it open and try and get some people to contribute. Uh, training's obviously important for you to accelerate and prove. You know, um, there's a host of uh, things you can do. If you're lucky, if you're employed, you might even pay for it. The binding, I didn't want to pay for that um, because we actually do this type of thing. Computers, I've spent a fortune. You don't need to. Computers today, you just basically keep it simple and don't overcapitalize. You can get something from that budget range that'll meet um, your needs, whatever it happens to be, even a laptop. The, the technology when we did it just didn't exist. Yeah, it didn't exist. Um, software, you're gonna need a layout program and an image editor. That's basically what it comes down to. MS Publisher is good enough for your purposes. And if you know how to use Word well, you can do a nice result. But most people typically don't with these applications. Um, and no matter whether you use InDesign or something like that, it isn't going to improve the quality of your job. It's about your skills behind it. Um, but the key thing is that Photoshop and Design Quark, these pieces of software are really expensive and they're expensive to keep up with. There are some other options for you. Obviously, look for open source, and there are lots. Um, and most of them are far more powerful and flexible than what we ever had. Um, and uh, those are just some suggestions. Um, but there's also lots of gaming software out there to make life easy. Why the image drop to the window, I don't know. Um, but to do mapping and deck plans and you name it, they're out there, they're all about 30 to 50 US dollars. Um, and they do everything for you now. So if you're trying to do maps, deck plans, star charts, they can lots of icon sets. So you don't have to do it, so that solves some of your problems. <laughs> So, shaping the idea, obviously just draft it, your idea, outline your the proposed project, trial it, see how it's going to be received, break it down, and start moving forward. Obviously, you writing is about it, it's hard yards. Proofing, reading, and editorial work are so important, and blind testing the product um, are going to be things. Art and design, you can use a lot of templates um, out there, there's tons of them. Stock art, believe it or not, there is actually gaming stock art, or you can pay for services. That's an example of stock art off the site. Just look at what their um, terms are. You may be able to negotiate with the publisher directly to use it. ISBN registration is really good, simple. Um, it's managed through the National Library. Um, you can look up the form online. It's no hassle to do. I suppose the major thing is digital versus offset printing. Digital's cheap, it's great, but offset kind of gets the volumes. So I don't think about that, which is good. Product trials, like us, go and attend lots of conventions, hopefully more than we do. Uh, get regular gaming groups, a web presence, and obviously ebook sales. I think it's a really good thing, and a lot of print on demand vendors, and this keeps it cheap. This site, rpgnow.com, um, and it has another sister site uh, called Drive Through RPG. Dot com is a really good one. They sell most of the major label games, so you'll find D&D of every version on there. Um, Traveller, a whole lot of the old stuff as well being sold. But you can sign up and sell your product through them as well. And you can buy gaming software that we'll just show you some screenshots off, off that site as well. So this is an example of what we're talking about, these um, e-book um, vendors who are making a big dent in the industry. Until you trial it, look what your product is. You still have to market your product. 
even though you'd be selling it through them. But they, they do it rather well. Um, we've just signed up. Um, this is what we've been looking for. We couldn't afford to build um, what they wanted because DRM used to be the big thing, but now it's not. So, And when you're going to get serious, you're going to have to do your market research, find out really what your audience is, how they like it, things like that. Write a business plan, a marketing plan, a budget, and then make a decision of whether you're going to go sole trade partnership or not or with the company. This is quite important at this stage, um, and it will obviously just to tax registrations. This is where things get complicated if you're going to take on the business. If you don't know how to, there are plenty of courses to go and get the training in that. And then the funding because this is why you need plans to figure out how much money you need and then you better go and get it and those plans are going to be quite important. Obviously your own money, if you've got a lot of assets that's great or you feel like mortgage in the house. Um, you can borrow from the team, friends and family. Grants are quite hard to get news on um, for this kind of endeavor. Um, however, if you're an ethnic minority with um, disabilities and various things, it's quite easy. Um, or you can take it onto a rugby team or something. Like yeah. That. Yeah, 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 yeah. Role playing game. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Try and get the uh, uh, franchise license for the All Blacks for a role playing game. Venture capital is very hard in New Zealand. Unlike other markets, we are a relatively young economy and not a lot of people have a lot of spare cash. People's ideas of venture capital, as we discussed with them, they want to give you a lot of money, but they want it back in a year, and they want controlling interest. Uh, we found. And for us as a role player, it's a product they don't un understand. They don't really understand it. So if it was a computer game to do, if your business plan gets to the point where you need a lot of it, I think you need to go back to make it work, go back and reevaluate the plan because there's no way of moving forward. And that's part of the reason we waited. We couldn't get venture capital and years have gone by, so we basically just stopped until conditions changed, which is another legitimate plan. So, Doing a full role playing game like we've got is like the equivalent of doing a doctoral thesis. It's probably actually a lot of time involved. So yeah, there's a lot of effort. But if you keep it simple um, and uh, avoid spending a lot of money, um, then you'll probably make a really good go of it. And I'd say that if I was doing it now, what I could put together, I'd probably do it on this little laptop um, with no more software than what my uh, came with it, actually, to be honest. Um, and um, I would go down the ebook path. And CD ROMs are really easy now with the printable disc labels and DVDs, so you can do that. And with digital printing, drop the right down um, price wise, you know, you've got a really nice sharp product. So I'll end there because a lot of people have seen the room. If anyone has any questions, I'm going to be in the Cuba room, so if you want to come ask questions, talk, chat, we'll be down there. Thank you.